this effort to uh, establish trust and, and make a connection with your students is about mitigating the distance in an online course. One thing I do at the beginning of the semester, and students always say that they like this, um, is that I call them. Uh, my, at my college, uh, I'm provided with phone numbers of my students. Um, so I give them a courtesy call, very quick call. It usually lasts less than five minutes, uh, just to introduce myself and tell them that I'm looking forward to teaching them in the online course. And it really goes a long way. You'd be shocked how dramatic that can positively impact a student's learning experience when you just give them the option. You can say, hey, do your research and then give me a presentation, or do your research, write me a research paper, or do your research and present with your group um, a brief you know, mini lecture on the subject. You have the extroverted students who are like, oh, I got a presentation, no, no problem. I can, I'll do the research, but I can wing it if I need to because that's what I'm comfortable in. You have the students who are more introverted that say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm doing a presentation. Like if I had to do that, I'd be really stressed out, but I can do a research paper, no problem. Then they get to, essentially you give the students the ability to demonstrate their level of mastery in a way that they're most comfortable with. So not only can they be more excited or at least less anxious about demonstrating that, but you can still have the same kind of groundwork in your rubrics. Each, pro each of the three choices can still demonstrate the same amount of mastery, but just by giving them a choice how, it's incredible. I have them send me a course mail, an angel course mail, telling me what their backup plan is. Because not uh, having a functioning computer is not an excuse. Um, and I've only had to uh, revisit the backup plan once when a student said to me, oh, my computer is broken, uh, I wasn't able to do the work. And then I went back and looked at his backup plan and saw he had a plan, but he didn't implement it. So there was no mercy on that one. <laughs> I've fallen back on wikis a lot. I've, I, uh, for example, used a wiki um, in a freshman seminar recently where I was asking students to go out and choose their own technologies for mocking up an application or, or app that they were envisioning. They didn't, and I didn't want them to program anything, but I was charging them with saying, okay, what's a great idea for an app and how would that look if you put it together? Well, here again, there's 20 different ways of, of uh, doing that, free online tools. I charged them with picking those tools and we used a wiki to um, mediate the process of sharing that and commenting among the, among the class. So you go in, you create a page for the tool you, you chose, um, write a little bit about it, makes it very easy to link out to the tool itself, and then for other people to come in and say, oh yeah, I tried that and I liked it, or nah, there's this weird paywall and, and I didn't like it for this reason. Um, so I think for, for that type of class application, uh, a wiki is ideal. Instead of, you know, tell me about yourself, which was, is a classic icebreaker, we do uh, two, two truths and a lie, which is a lot of fun. You know, they obviously say two things that are true about themselves, and one is the lie. And I started off with, with mine, and um, they, they always um, miss it because I don't like pizza, and I know I'm in the minority. And when I put that down, they always think, oh, you know, you know that's a lie. And they're very surprised to find it's the truth. The way I use small group projects in my course, it's not exactly a project, it's peer review. So um, they go into a discussion forum, they put it, uh, they attach their essay, and then um, they're created into like th two or three um, people groups, and they critique each other's papers. And they have gotten very creative over the years. They use track changes in Word now to uh, do um, critiques of the writing of their classmates. 
and it, then it becomes a longer discussion. They start talking to each other about, well, did you understand the assignment to be this? I, this is the way I read that. And I can see all that, so if there's something they really don't understand, I can go in and talk about it. The course is broken into modules, and I would have one discussion for the whole two weeks. And of course, uh, right before the module was to end, there was a lot of activity in the discussion. People were putting their two cents in at the last minute, trying to beat the clock, which of course defeats the whole purpose of discussion because it has to develop over time. So then, once again, I learned that when I do this again, I'll have to change my methods, which I did. And since then, I now, instead of having one discussion for two weeks, I have one discussion per week. And the first response must be made within the first three days that the discussion is available. And that has worked out much better. Uh, one of the things I do in my lectures is I, as I put little HTML buttons in there. So I ask a question of the student throughout a lecture. I'll stop with my lecture, even though it's written and it's in text a lot like a, a traditional, any other online class you look at for the most part. Um, but I'll stop my lecture in the middle and ask a question. And I'll put a little button there that will pop up an answer. So I know it's a simple way to provide interaction, but it stops the process of reading. And we all know that if we've read, if you ever read or fallen asleep reading a book, it's the same thing online. You become accustomed to um, uh, hypnotized uh, when you're reading um, large volumes of text. And then there's no, it's no different in a, in a class. Um, students get bored. Sometimes they space out. How many times have you reread a paragraph? When you're, when you're reading a text or a book of some sort, it happens all the time. So to stop that process in the middle um, and, and engage them in some way helps. I also um, encourage students to come and visit me if they're taking uh, classes on campus. Come to my office, visit me. Uh, because I notice um, many times I, I never meet them. And I hear, hear their name announced at graduation. And I say, oh my gosh, that's whoever. And at that point, it's, it's kind of late to make the connection. I also uh, drive them to um, write up their own test questions. So I give them 25 different topics from the other half of the class. And, I, and it's, it's a way to engage them with the content yet again. And it's demonstrating to them uh, a way to study. It's demonstrating to them that, um, that they need to engage in that content. I do give them the li a list of, of topic areas, of things, and kind of guide them. Again, I think of myself as a guide and not the, and not the person that has all the information. Um, I, I, so I guide them and say, these are the things that, uh, the areas that are important. Give me a test question that you think would be appropriate um, at this point in time, given what you know relative to the, the, the course content. Teaching a foreign language, I'm able to focus on, uh, to focus on skills that students want to learn. Um, so as an example too, the, the writing skill, not so important for students. So traditionally, we, uh, most of us probably remember writing things all the time in our foreign language class and being graded on our writing for the most part. So in my course, uh, I try to, um, I allow my students to choose between either writing their exercises or speaking their exercises. And I provide feedback to them either way. I actually, something else I have the students do in this course that I've really been excited about is I have the students themselves create videos. Um, they have to teach essentially one of the examples from the book, uh, an exercise from the book, and explain how it works and, and, and work through the problem. They get bonus points if they can show themselves writing it out as they talk about it, um, or if they use the applet to visually verify their results within the video, or uh, do an extraordinary 
clear job, uh, they get some bonus points. And it's really been a, a really exciting assignment that I was a little bit, um, I don't know, unsure of how well it would be received by the students if they think it was too much. But it turned out the students loved it. Um, some of them, a lot of the students have said it was their favorite assignment in the course or assignments. I give it two different places and uh, they recommended I do it more often. So the, although that's not necessarily happened yet because of how long it takes me to grade them and watch all of them, I've really been excited about that also, seeing the students share their own uh, learning with the other students and with me. And they've shared that the most important aspect of that was not so much watching their classmates' videos, but how well they had to learn the material themselves for the example that they presented, and that they really were excited about that. And of course, they learned some skills in presentation and using some kind of software to record themselves. And they use their iPad or their iPhone sometimes. And it all you know, works out at the stage. It's really exciting what they can do. I have a great professor at my university. I was talking to her yesterday. And we've been talking on and on for the last year and a half. And I, I wrote her a blog post about a year ago, essentially saying, you can give up your curriculum. All you need is a syllabus. If you have a syllabus, and then you let the students build that curriculum. She teaches a perfect, it's a perfect course for it. She has case studies in marketing. So she sends out a challenge to the students. They go and gather from all over the web and then they do that online and then when they come back to class, all they, she does, she doesn't actually go through the content, she goes through the meta conversation. Why did you pick that? Did you see this piece when you gathered that piece of information? Oh wow, you put those two pieces together. That's really crafty because those are the actual literacies that those students need. They don't need to remember the name of that marketing approach or the whatever, anything that you would test on a multiple choice test. They need all of these surrounding skills, all that stuff that, that the labor market is saying they want that can't be taught from a textbook, that can't be learned by rote, that's not about a step-by-step -step process. Rethinking what an online course even looks like. Um, does it necessarily need to just be a series of links where you read or a series of discussion forums or a series of polls and things like that you answer? Or can it be an entire online experience that's, you know, part scavenger hunt, part, you know, IRL, you know, networking community uh, opportunities um, and, you know, very self-directed learning at its core. If we move up the ladder in terms of critical thinking skills, the, you know, the ethical computing that I talked about, I do tend to rely on things like discussion, but I also prime the pump a lot with current events, uh, you know, whether it's right now net neutrality, for instance. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to any of us? Can we even understand that? It, it's situated in what's happening right now because I think those are the emerging issues all of us should be aware of. I also have a current events section in every module and that's another thing that generates uh, another discussion sometimes depending on what it is. Um, in one of my uh, in my marketing class right now um, I had posted about how um, some of the cable channels are speeding up the shows to get in more commercials um, and that initiated a whole uh, third discussion going on. I usually have them introduce themselves, but also um, have a short discussion about, um, in my class, because it's a literature class, what do you like to read? What do you read in your spare time? And that has never failed to get my students talking. They talk about, well, I'm a student now, and so really the only thing I ever get to read is a textbook, or I'm a student and I read textbooks, but I have three kids, and so I read children's books. The last book I read was, you know, The Cat in the Hat. <laughs> and so they start to, they don't have to tell in the introduction a lot about themselves, but it all starts coming out. And then, uh, you know, this is my favorite author. Oh, have you read this by him? He's my favorite author too. And it just, becomes a really long discussion and it forms a really nice sense of community. I send them a welcome letter. Um, for example, this 
uh, spring semester, I sent them the letter on January, tw uh, January 5th because our semester was beginning on January 24th. And the course actually opens up a week before the semester begins as well. And the welcome letter tells them the textbook that they need. Uh, it also um, tells them that this is going to be a different experience from what they've had before. Uh, and it also includes a course syllabus. And this way, if they don't like what they read or it's not what they thought it would be, uh, they have time you know, to withdraw and perhaps find another class. It's a modular course and every module starts by posing a problem to the student and says, um, here's a problem, how would you solve it with computing? Um, one example is that the first module, in the first module, someone takes over someone's identity. So the task of the students is to figure out who stole their identity, right? So they analyze data trails and, uh, and things that the identity thief left behind to figure out who it is. Um, instead of putting tests on, I now have um, quizzes for every chapter. But I let them take the quizzes as many times as they want until they are satisfied with their grade. So now those students who would take the quiz at 11 o'clock on a Sunday evening when the module closes at 11.55 p.m., now if they get a grade of 60, they'll realize, hey, you know, maybe I should take this quiz a little sooner and then if I don't do very well, I'll have time to take it again and again and again. <laughs> Plus, of course, it's, they're getting different um, questions each time, so they're learning while they're doing this, and, and it's really a form, <coughs> excuse me, of mastery learning. So the first thing they see is um, they see a pop-up that has a welcome message for, to them. And that pop-up gives them immediate directions on the first things I want them to do. And that very first thing that I want them to do, the action that I want them to take, is to actually send me a course mail message. And there's a reason for that. And I talk to my faculty all the time that if everything else fails, as long as they can communicate with me and they know how to communicate with me, I can fix everything else. Communication is the most important thing. Whether in, in all the aspects of the things that we do, especially with teaching and learning, with an online class and a student taking their class work at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, whenever it is that it's available to them, as long as they know how to ask a question and where to ask the question of, everything else can be solved. All other problems can be taken care of, as long as they can get to me and I can then respond to them. So I ask them to communicate with me immediately. That's the very first thing I ask my students to do. And I give them credit for doing it because they've now navigated the system successfully. I think that's an important part of learning. Can you navigate the system successfully? And I give them credit for doing that and then I turn around and, assure, and, uh, and, and respond to that and let them know that not only did I receive it, but I also say I'm here to help in that response. Last summer, I went through the Leadership Academy through, um, it was a Doodle scholarship, which is Directors of Online, whatever the heck Doodle stands for. And um, I, got to, I got to go to this Leadership Academy and meet people from all over the country who work at community colleges and are dealing with the same kind of issues and wonderfulness of what online education is throughout the country. And one of the initiatives um, through that organization, um, because they're part of um, American Association of Community Colleges, they're um, c thinking of ways in which to connect to federal um, resources. And so one of the cool things that we're working on through there is connecting the National Parks and Library of Congress to people's online courses. And how cool is that? So that part of your meteorology course will connect you to the webcams of um, Acadia National Park or to Yellowstone or to have conversations with um, park rangers and stuff like that. And 
you know, really immerse into the resources that we actually have at our fingertips. On my webpage, then within the course, um, I break down and explain both um, the topic for that video and how long that whole video is, including all the parts. Because I think it's important that students have a sense for how long am I going to be sitting here if I'm going to watch this component, this topic. And of course, it's usually less than 50 minutes, less than a regular class time, but still it's nice for them to know if this is a 30 minute commitment or a 40 minutes or an 18 minute commitment. It, it sort of gives them a sense for, for that ahead of time. Technology, uh, when it's used correctly, um, can also support things that we've found um, at NIU to be, to be important for success, such as what we call the early and often assessment philosophy. So, um, for example, courses in the first year learning initiative are required to have some kind of graded assessment in the first two weeks of class. So we picked this as kind of the sensitive period. And it's not so much that you're, you know, having to do some very complex assessment of something you've taught. It's really more about sending a message to students that we get started right away, giving them feedback, um, and encouraging things like syllabus quizzes that we know help ensure that our early career students have actually seen the requirements of the course and had an opportunity to engage with that material. Mm -hmm.